Hummeldorf with us, and he's going to be sharing a couple slides with us this morning as well. Um, we're going to start out with the first slide here. Okay, this is information about Jan, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jan. Um, for those of you who are, this can be a little review, and for those of you who aren't, we'll just give you a little bit of information about what we do and who we are. Uh, Jan was established in 1983 as a national free service. Now, we are located on the beautiful campus of West Virginia University, but we are a national service, and the uh, con consultative services are free. No matter how many times you call, it's free. We specialize in job accommodations and the employment provisions of the ADA and related legislation. And the ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act and related legislation such as the Rehabilitation Act. We assist with the interactive process and that can be at any time throughout that process, whether it's the beginning or you're not sure what to do or you're stuck in the middle. Um, I had a, uh, I'll never forget, this is one of my first employer calls when I first started and the, the uh, caller said she had enough, she had just enough information to be dangerous and she really needed some help. And so if, if you have a simple question, that, that's fine. Call and get that answered. We give targeted technical assistance. We provide comprehensive resources on uh, disabilities, different agencies, organizations like yourself. Uh, we maintain confidentiality and I think that's one of the really imp important points to bring out that because it's confidential, uh, callers are free to explore all their options and, and talk openly and honestly about what's going on in situations. Uh, you can communicate via telephone, chat, text, TTY, relay, email, Skype, and other social networks. So there's really uh, no way that you can't get a hold of us. We offer live and archive training, the live training like we're doing right now, and then we have some modules and different trainings that are archived that you can find on our site. And that we work as a partner in making model employers. We talk to um, whoever calls, <clears throat> excuse my voice, a lot of times that'll be uh, parents or employees, employers, people who don't have a job who are wanting information about accommodations, um, attorneys. We, we talk to whoever calls really and needs help with information on the ADA. Now, one thing I, I wanted to say is we will be taking questions at the end. We're going to go ahead and go through the presentation, and then we'll be happy to answer questions at the end. All right. I'm going to be talking about bipolar, and I, and I know you've heard that expression about preaching to the choir. So we're, we're certainly not experts on, on bipolar and we're not doctors, um, but we do want to present some bipolar information just so you can see where we're coming from when we talk about the accommodations. Um, we do get our information from reputable sources. Your source is one of those. And the resources will be listed at the end of the webcast, uh, the resources that we use. Okay, what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is a chronic illness with recurring episodes of mania and depression that can last from one day to months. This mental health impairment causes unusual and dramatic shifts in mood, energy, and the ability to think clearly. Cycles of high, manic, and low, depressive moods may follow an irregular pattern that differs from the typical ups and downs experienced by most people. Jim? <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so people with bipolar disorder have unusually intense emotional experiences, states that occur in what's called mood episodes, uh, and that's that's really a drastic change from their usual mood and, and behavior. They can be overly uh, happy or excited uh, during a manic episode or uh, extremely uh, sad and and hopeless feeling in a depressive episode. Those episodes can also be mixed with symptoms of both mania and depression. Um, and people sometimes are also uh, unusually explosive and irritable during a mood episode, particularly a manic episode. All right, the symptoms of bipolar. Uh, there can be extreme changes in energy, activity, sleep, and behavior that go along with the changes in mood. 
These symptoms can make daily life difficult to manage. Taking care of important tasks and functioning at school and at work can be adversely affected. So again, symptoms of mania can include the person feeling extremely happy for an unusually long period of time or euphoric. Um, an abnormally increased level of irritability, they can feel overconfident, have an inflated sense of self-esteem, uh, they're often very overly talkative, uh, pressured speech it's sometimes called. Um, they often have trouble sleeping and often are found engaging in risky behavior like spending a great deal of money or in involving themselves in impulsive sexual activity. Uh, they can also have racing thoughts and uh, thoughts jumping from one thing to another. <clears throat> they're often easily distractible <clears throat> and can feel agitated or jumpy. The symptoms of depression can include a diminished capacity for pleasure or a loss of interest in things that they usually enjoy. That's called anhedonia. Uh, they can have long periods of time of feeling hopeless, helpless, or low self-esteem. That's sometimes called abolition. Uh, they have decreased energy, feeling constantly tired. You hear people say things like, I just could not get out of bed today. Um, they have difficulty sometimes concentrating and making decisions that they're usually easily able to make. There are disruptions in their eating and sleeping and other usual daily habits. Uh, they can be either agitated or slowed down in terms of moving, speaking, or thinking. And uh, sometimes have suicidal thoughts or just thoughts of death or even suicidal attempts. All right, the states of mania and depression can occur in distinct episodes or can switch rapidly even multiple times in one week. A person who's experiencing a severe bipolar episode may also have hallucinations, psychotic symptoms, and delusions. Not everyone's symptoms are the same and the severity of mania and depression can vary. And because not everyone's symptoms are the same or their limitations are not going to be the same. Um, each individual with bipolar disorder should be considered individually and decisions at, at work about accommodation should be made based on specific information that the employer would receive from medical documentation and from the employee themselves. Okay, now we're going to look at how bipolar disorder can specifically affect individuals at work. And these are some common limitations. Not everybody will have all of these and they wouldn't have them all at one time. But these are just some common limitations associated with bipolar. And those can be uh, memory, concentration, fatigue, organization, emotions and stress, attendance, sleep disturbances, working effectively, and issues with change. And we're going to go over each one of these individually with uh, an example here in just a little bit. I'd just like to give you some statistics here first. Um, between 5.8 and 10 million Americans have bipolar disorder, and that varies in, in such a big number there because a lot of people are suspected to have bipolar, a lot of people aren't, haven't been diagnosed. Bipolar disorder affects men and women equally. Although the disease can occur at any point in life, more than one half of all cases begin between the ages of 15 and 25. For many people with bipolar disorder, the stigma can be worse than the condition. And for that reason, uh, bipolar disorder is often revealed in the workplace only when a crisis occurs. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit here about the Americans with Disabilities Act and mental health impairments. And we're going to talk here about the, the ADAAA is the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act. And it kind of changed the definition of disability, uh, some of the um, qualifications. And so the definition of a disability is a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Major life activities can include things that we do every day without much thought, such as walking, talking, eating, remembering, concentrating, seeing, and hearing. And with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act, the activities of daily living were expanded to include bodily functions. 
these include but are not limited to digestive, respiratory, and reproductive functions, as well as neurological and brain function. And although there's no list of conditions or impairments that qualify as a disability under the ADA, there are several mental health impairments that are always going to be covered because they substantially limit brain function. Bipolar is one of these, as well as major depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and schizophrenia. Okay, now we're going to talk about disclosure. And under the, the Americans with Disabilities Act, you do not have to disclose a disability until you need an accommodation. So if you don't need an accommodation, you never have to disclose a disability. And, and disclosure it is a personal decision that each individual makes according to when they feel they need to do that, if they need accommodations. So first we're going to talk about why do you disclose. So three reasons, three main reasons to disclose would be to ask for job accommodations, and that would be if you need some sort of, of change or, or modification in the workplace. The next would be to receive benefits or privileges of employment. And we'll just talk about, just briefly about benefits of employment. Um, the ADA requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations so that employees with disabilities can enjoy benefits and privileges of employment that are equal to those that are enjoyed by employees without disabilities. And benefits and privileges of employment can include training, uh, they can include services such as um, an employee assistance program, credit unions, cafeterias, lounges, auditoriums, transportation, and it can also include uh, social functions such as parties that would celebrate retirements or birthdays or company outings such as picnics. So if an employee with a disability needs a reasonable accommodation in order to gain access to or have an equal opportunity to participate in any of these benefits, then the employer must provide the accommodation unless it would cause a hardship. I'm going to give you an example here. If an employee with bipolar who has difficulty with remembering training that's presented orally is required to go to that type of training, then an accommodation of a note taker or the use of a digital recorder may be needed and could be requested. Okay, the next reason to disclose would be to explain an unusual circumstance. Uh, sometimes employees may need to disclose their disability or explain an unusual circumstance. For someone with bipolar, this could mean that a spouse or a family member could be allowed to call in and report absences when necessary due to the uh, inability of an employee to do so on their own if they were going through some type of an episode. Sometimes employers will have a policy where the employee themselves has to call in. And so there could be a change in policy so that you know a spouse or a family member could be allowed to call in for that person. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about how to disclose. The individual must let the employer know that an adjustment or change at work is needed for a reason related to a medical condition. And you, to request an accommodation, you can use plain English. You don't have to use the word ADA. You don't have to use the phrase reasonable accommodation. It can be as simple as saying to your employer, I'm having difficulty getting to work on time because of a medical condition, and I'd like to talk to you about that. Um, it does not have to be in writing. It can just be a, a conversation. We do recommend that you put it in writing and if you want to have a conversation to follow that up in writing and that way you have the documentation that you did disclose that and, and speak to someone. All right, so who do you disclose to? Verbally or in writing, you can tell your employer, your supervisor, an HR representative, or another appropriate person. Now sometimes employees don't want their supervisor or their manager to know about their medical condition and so going straight to HR might be a, a, a good solution for that. Um, medical information is highly confidential and, and should be kept in a separate folder, uh, a locked cabinet separate from your personnel information. And so somebody needs to have that information to determine if, if the uh, impairment or disability does qualify under the ADA. And then once they determine that, that information can be filed away 
but the supervisor or manager may have to have, you know, some information about limitations if they're going to work with helping uh, provide accommodation on the job. Okay, now we're going to get to the good part, job accommodations. We're going to talk about productivity first, just real quick. Under the ADA, an employer never has to lower a performance or a production standard. Uh, they can do so if they wish. They can go above and beyond the ADA, but they're not required to do that. So if somebody is having trouble meeting a performance or a production standard because of a disability, then the employer would be required to look at providing accommodations to help that individual meet that performance standard. Okay. Our first example here is a production manager for a large manufacturer who had bipolar disorder. His duties included working 40 hours per week with additional overtime to complete and oversee paperwork and shipping orders. He was not meeting his production standard. Okay, we're going to talk about some accommodation ideas here for concentration. And, and let me just say that these are some accommodation, these are some common accommodations. Uh, nobody should need all of these, and um, you may need something that's not on this list, and that's okay. These are just some common ones. It's a good place to start to help figure out what, what you may need in a job. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is reducing distractions in the workplace, and that can be the, by the use of space enclosures or cubicles, sound absorption panels, or a private office. Sometimes a private office is not an option. Um, Cubicles can be put up. There can be cubicles that are, are uh, more soundproof than others. They can have walls that go to the ceiling. They can have sound absorption panels put in there. Possibly if somebody's in a cubicle and they're in the middle of a sea of cubicles and it's very noisy and, dis and they're distracted, then maybe an accommodation could be to look at moving that cubicle to, a, to an outside area where there's less noise or even to a separate area, not to isolate somebody, but to give them a more quiet workspace. White noise, uh, music player or environmental sound machines can be used, and those usually are based on personal preference. A lot of people like to listen to music, like with one earbud, and then have the other ear open to kind of hear what's going on. Those can all help with distractions. Uninterrupted off work time. And that simply means to have some time scheduled every day, possibly, or once a week, twice a week, however that could work in the job, where the person's working without interruptions. And that would be like without phone calls or without people coming to the office, um, anything that, that is distracting to them and whatever would work in the workplace. The last thing there is desk organizers, and, and that can mean about anything that, that would help, folders. Um, Sometimes people have too many things on their desk that distract themselves, and so sometimes cleaning up your desk can also help with that, so you're less distracted. Okay, here are some more ideas. To increase natural lighting or provide full-spectrum lighting, and that type of lighting can increase, can increase productivity and alertness. Uh, you can divide large assignments into smaller tasks and goals, or you can chunk like assignments together. And, and I don't know if any of you have ever done like a task analysis, but that can be done to, to break down assignments into specific tasks. If someone's having difficulty completing their assignments. Um, you can use auditory or written cues as appropriate. You can restructure the job to include only the essential functions. Now, under the ADA, you never have to remove essential functions. An employer can do that and go above and beyond the ADA. Some do that temporarily if someone's having um, some temporary difficulty, maybe when there's been a change of medication or something. But they certainly can take the marginal functions away from someone to allow them more time to complete their essential functions. Uh, they can also provide memory aids such as schedulers, calendars, email add-ons, or apps. And one thing to remember here is just that the training is important. Uh, someone may not know how to use a, a device or, or an app, and so training would be very important to help them. Okay, the accommodation here for the production manager is that initially he was allowed to work 30 hours per week for one month, increasing to 40 hours per week for the next month. Then the manager returned back to his regular schedule. 
He was also provided a work area that was away from noise and given earbuds to listen to music. He also met briefly with his supervisor once a week to discuss workload issues. Our next example here is a project manager who was having difficulty keeping up with all of the information involved in managing the project he had been assigned to. He had difficulty with organization, time management, and prioritizing. Okay, let's look at here at some accommodation ideas for organization. You can use daily, weekly, and monthly task lists. Uh, someone who does the same thing pretty much every day may only need a, a daily task list. Um, you know, if certain things are done only on Mondays or certain things done on Thursdays, then somebody may need a weekly task list, or they may need all of them if they have certain things that are done first time of the month. Uh, but the, the important thing would be to have the least amount of paperwork possible to help keep, keep it organized. Um, you can use a calendar with automated reminders to highlight meetings and deadlines, divide large assignments into smaller tasks and goals, and some of these accommodation ideas, they do sort of overlap and, and some of them will be repeated. You can use a color, color coding scheme to prioritize tasks. Um, some people use red, yellow, and green like, like a stoplight. Red means it's urgent, something needs to get out. You could use highlighters for that. You can use colored folders. Some people even use like um, colored paper clips to help with that. And I've seen people that use color coding in their planners and the whole planner looks like a rainbow, but then they know exactly, you know, just by glancing what they have to do based on those colors. You can also use electronic organizers or mobile devices and apps. And again, the training there is very important. Okay, this project manager was accommodated with the use of project management software that kept him organized and abreast of all the team members' work. Color coding helped him with prioritization. And the beauty of this accommodation was that it just didn't help him. It helped all the team members stay better organized. Okay, our next example here is a customer service representative with bipolar disorder who experienced extreme fatigue during the afternoon, which had an effect on her speed. So we're going to look here at some accommodation ideas for fatigue allow a flexible work environment. Now that can mean about, about anything. Um, people can have a flexible schedule if they work, um, you know, where their work, when other coworkers work isn't dependent on them, maybe they can come in later when they're having issues. Uh, that could also mean allowing the person to do the work that involves the most concentration or stamina at the time when they're at their best. Some people are at their best in the morning, and to so do that kind of heavy work in the morning, some people are better off in the afternoons. And if work doesn't have to be done at a specific time, kind of a rearranging the schedule so that person can, can work when they're at their best. Uh, provide a goal-oriented workload. Reduce or eliminate physical exertion and workplace stress. And, and that might be just looking at, you know, does the person have to travel back and forth, back and forth, multiple times in a day to the printer or to a fax machine or a copier or something like that. You know, would it be better for this person to have their own printer so they don't have to get up and, and walk back and forth? Another idea is to implement an ergonomic workstation design. And then last here is to regulate temperature and lighting. And uh, individual controlled lighting and temperature, if possible, would work. Okay, the accommodation solution here for the customer service representative was she was accommodated with a wireless headset, an articulating keyboard tray, and an ergonomic keyboard. Okay, our next example here is a long-time IT employee of a university who discloses that he's been having severe bouts of depression that have affected his ability to work the night shift. The employee requests that it should be changed to a day or evening one to help him better regulate his sleep. The manager is totally surprised because there have been no performance problems or issues of any kind with this employee. Okay, let's look here at some accommodation ideas for sleep disturbances. Allow for a flexible start time if, if possible. Um, you know, 
some jobs such as teaching or waitressing, others as well, uh, can't really have a flexible work time. Um, but many jobs can, and, and some employers have core hours where they have their employees have to be there during a certain range of time, and that, that can work very well if somebody can work eight to five one day, but you know, several days this week I, I had difficulty sleeping, and so it's better for me to come in and work nine to six. Uh, you can combine scheduled short breaks into one longer break. So somebody could rest or sleep. Sometimes that could mean taking longer breaks and dividing those up into shorter breaks so people can, and more frequent, so they can get up and walk around and uh, help feel better. You can provide a place for the employee to rest during a break. Uh, one example is, is an employee, employee who told me he was a federal worker and he had a cubicle that his fold-up lawn chair just fit into, one of those that uh, unfolded when you folded it back up into three parts and he just put it somewhere in, in his cubicle. But he would unfold that. He had combined a half an hour, like two 15-minute breaks and an hour or a half an hour lunch to equal an hour. And he laid down there in his cubicle and took a nap and it, it worked. It didn't disturb anybody else and he was able to do that and then work the rest of the afternoon. Um, you can allow employees to work one consistent schedule, and that way they have a more consistent sleep schedule. And then providing work areas with natural lighting, again, that can help increase productivity and alertness. And another thing is uh, having sips of water and getting up to move around a little bit can help oxygenate the brain. And so if that's possible, that could work as well. Uh, this uh, manager ask for medical documentation that will provide information as to why the accommodation is needed. The manager then takes a look at the IT schedules to see what can be done to assist this employee. We're going to look at some conduct issues. Conduct it is the same under the ADA as performance in that an employer does not have to reduce a conduct standard or remove it. And they can certainly have policies that they have zero tolerance for as well. Lots of times disability, um, disabilities aren't related to conduct issues. And if they are, then an employer does look at how can we accommodate this individual to help them meet that conduct standard. Here we have an example of a small school district's technology director who had difficulty managing his emotions while experiencing the side effects of a prescription change. He asked for an altered schedule uh, when the students weren't there and teamwork, or telework, I'm sorry, telework. Accommodation ideas here for emotions encourage the use of stress management techniques to deal with stress, frustration, and a place to, to do those. If somebody's out in the open in a room with you know six people, they might need a more private place to do that. Uh, you can allow telephone calls during work hours to doctors and others for needed support and sometimes just having the option to call for help when needed can reduce stress in a person. You know sometimes if a person feels they're trapped and there's no way they can call and talk to somebody their stress and anxiety emotional state can can become worse and so sometimes that can just help knowing that they can get help when they need it. Allow the presence of a support animal. You can allow flexible breaks. And then you can refer people to the employee assistance program or an employee wellness program. OK. This technology director was accommodated with telework and an altered schedule for three weeks. But he did need to be on site when students were present to diagnose and fix problems during an upcoming period of online achievement testing. Here we have an example of an employee with bipolar disorder who was having difficulties working in a busy central banking office. He managed a large staff of workers, provided customer service, and had daily oversight of the office. So here are some accommodation ideas for working effectively. Um, develop clear expectations of responsibilities and the consequences of not meeting performance standards. And concrete examples are really important when you're 
talking to someone about not meeting responsibilities or performance standards. I've talked to people who say that their supervisor told them they need to improve, but really didn't give them any ways and how to do that. And so it, it, it's a lot more helpful to talk to somebody about not meeting their deadlines rather than to just say you need to improve. You know, it's the more concrete examples you can give, the more helpful it, it is to the person. You can schedule consistent meetings with an employee to set goals and review progress. That could be once a week, it could be once every other week, it could be on Mondays and Fridays, whatever would be needed for, for that individual. And it, it could be a 10 minute meeting. Allow for open communication. And um, you know that's really one of the most important things in the accommodation process is, is open communication. It's, it's always gonna be helpful for the employee to, to know that they can come and discuss things with the employer and for the employer to be willing to carry on those, those conversations. And then lastly, you, you wanna establish written long-term and short-term goals and written ones that can be very helpful because the employee can go back to looking at those and there's never a question later, well, you didn't tell me that I needed to do this. Well, it's, you know, it's here in writing and this is what we need to look at. So those are all ways that you can help someone work effectively. And here is, is the accommodation for the, the, bank, the excuse me, bank manager. After meeting consistently with his supervisor, it was determined that he would be the ideal candidate to fill a recent opening in a smaller and less busy branch office. The employee maintained his salary and the responsibilities of his leadership role. And I'll talk just briefly about reassignment. A reassignment is, is usually a accommodation of last resort, but it can, can be done any time when the employer and the employee agree. It's when somebody is having difficulty with the essential functions of their position. And you don't have to create a position for someone and you don't have to bump someone out of a position. You would look at the open positions that the employee would be qualified for. Okay, our next example is a real estate appraiser with bipolar disorder and migraine headaches who became very stressed when her work environment was noisy. She became angry and was insubordinate to her supervisor. Okay, let's look here at some accommodations for managing stress. You can refer the employee to uh, counseling and the employee assistance program. You can allow telephone calls during work hours to doctors and others for needed support. And again, sometimes just knowing they have that ability can really help manage stress. You can allow the presence of a support animal. You can allow a flexible work environment, and that includes all of these things, which several we've talked about before, that can be flexible scheduling, a modified break schedule, now sometimes an employee may ask for additional breaks and an employer does not have to pay somebody um, to have more additional breaks, but that can be worked out if the job allows for that, somebody can come in maybe a half an hour earlier and then have an extra half an hour break in the afternoon or to have an hour lunch instead of a half hour lunch if, if that would help them. Leave for counseling. Now we haven't really talked about leave um, leave under the ADA, you can use vacation time, you can use sick leave, uh, but there's also unpaid leave where it's provided as an accommodation where somebody um, needs to have off to, to care for themselves or maybe like a therapy appointment or counseling appointment. Doesn't have to be uh, permanent thing. No accommodation is ever permanent. It can be a, even a temporary thing. A work from home or flexi place, same thing with that. You can look at that as a, a temporary accommodation. You can do that on a trial basis to see how well it would work. Even if the employer doesn't have a formal work at home policy, they can look at allowing an employee to work from home if that employee is able to do their job from home. And you can do a trial period of, for a couple weeks or a month, however long you would need and to make a really good effort to see if that accommodation is gonna be effective or not. And then the last thing there is to modify environmental triggers. And communication comes in here again. It's important to have communication to find out what those triggers are. You may be able to get that information from the, the medical professional, but you may be able to just get that from the employee themselves and find out what is causing the stress and what you can do to help alleviate that. Okay, 
This employee was given a headset to help reduce noise in her environment. She was also given a light dimmer to control her workstation lighting and help her with light sensitivity. She was also given time off or leave when she gets the migraine. And I don't know if you're familiar with FMLA. FMLA is, is federal leave and it's for 12 weeks. Now, the leave under the ADA works somewhat similar to that. It's not limited to 12 weeks, but it's not unlimited either. It's as much leave as an employee needs until it would cause a hardship for the employer. Okay, now we're going to look here at some issues with job performance. Here's an electrician with bipolar disorder who needed to attend periodic licensure trainings. Uh, the person had difficulty taking effective notes and remembering information in the meetings. Okay, here we're going to look at some accommodation ideas for memory, and, and there are a multitude of accommodation ideas for memory. And anything that somebody does, and a lot of us, particularly as we get older, have come up with ways to help ourselves with memory. Um, and so a lot of people can do this on their own until it gets to a certain point and they may need some assistance. One of the ideas is to allow the use of a job coach or provide a mentor. And that could be a mentor could be somebody, a, a coworker or someone who knows the job, um, can help this person, who does a good job with their work and can help the person come up with some ways to help them remember what they need to do. Uh, the use of auditory or written cues. Uh, you can allow the use of additional training time, which you can retrain in part or full. Somebody may need just retraining in, in part of a procedure that they can't seem to remember and then maybe have those written steps that they could look back to. You can provide written checklists. You can provide a color coding scheme to prioritize tasks. And we talked about that in the past. Uh, my suggestion here would be to, unless you're using totally, totally different uh, projects, you probably want to keep the color coding the same to prevent confusion. You can use notebooks, planners, sticky notes, and apps to record information. And I'll just mention here, I, I have had a coworker in the past who used sticky notes, and it got to be where he used so many sticky notes that they they, they weren't helpful at all. So you want to be careful that you don't have too many notes because you don't know where to look and, and what you need to be doing. Um, you can provide labels or a bulletin board to assist in locating items. Those could be items in a cabinet or items in drawers. And that can be another accommodation that can help coworkers, can help everybody if things are labeled and then everybody knows where they need to go to get supplies. The last one here is to provide minutes of meetings and trainings. A lot of, lots of times people that have um, any kind of mental health impairment or um, attention problems, memory issues, it's really difficult to process information that you're hearing in a meeting and then write that at the same time and then keep up with what the person's saying, you know, next. And so apps or digital recorders can be very helpful in that regard. Or you can have somebody uh, in the meeting take notes, somebody that is able to listen and take good notes. You'd want to be careful that you, you, know, you wouldn't say that the person was taking notes for a specific person, but that's another accommodation that can help others. And they can distribute those um, meeting notes or minutes to everyone. And then those who don't need them, they don't need to look at them. But those notes could be helpful to, to other people, not just the person with a disability. Okay, the individual here was provided an iPad with apps that would record the trainings. This enabled him to listen to the trainings as many times as he needed. He was also provided training on how to use the device and the app. Okay, here's an example of a federal office worker was trying to plan ahead for a future move to a smaller office space in a new location that was causing a lot of distress. And not only were they going to be moving into a smaller space, but there were going to be more people packed into that small space. So here's some accommodation ideas for change. It's really important to recognize that a change in the office environment or supervisors may be difficult. And the plan, uh, have a tr transition plan to help the employee deal with that 
change. Uh, maintaining open channels of communication is very important. You can provide weekly or monthly meetings to discuss issues and production levels. And, and one thing would be to, to give employees plenty of time ahead of time to know about the change and, and to adjust to that. Because, you know, just bringing a change on people at the last minute is, is not always going to be a good idea. Okay, this employee requested the opportunity to meet with her supervisor in the planning stages of relocating and placing employees in their specific locations within the new office to help ease her anxiety in the transition. And she was granted that accommodation, and so she was involved in the planning. So she had some say. I don't know how much say she really had in where she would be located, but she understood what they were doing and she understood that ahead of time and that was important. Okay, due to medication, an attorney experienced memory deficits that affected his ability to recall actions and activities during depositions. The attorney became frustrated and began to miss and reschedule meetings. Here are some accommodation ideas for attendance. And I think we've talked about pretty much most of these. You can allow flexible scheduling, modified break schedule, leave for counseling, work from home or flexi place, and to modify environmental triggers. And again, that would be um, allowing for open communication to determine what those triggers are. Uh, one thing I just wanted to, to say here, the EEOC talks about absences and that the employer can expect an employee to have reliable and consistent attendance. You know, if it's a full-time job, it's created for full-time work, and that an employer may have questions about whether a person is really qualified for a position if they miss a lot of work, and particularly if it's in an unpredictable manner. And it's up to the employer to determine how many absences become a hardship. And so um, just wanted to uh, listeners to be, to be aware of that. Okay, here's an accommodation for the attorney. He was given an alternate site to take the deposition. He was moved to a smaller conference room with natural lighting away from the office noise. Now, we've got a couple more examples that are just good examples I wanted to include, and Jim's going to go over some of those with you. Jim? Okay. Um, as Melanie said earlier, an uh, employee has to disclose their disability in order to request an accommodation. So in this example, um, this person is asking for a flexible schedule because she's had a med medication change that's disrupting her sleep pattern. Um, so she's been late for work and she's really concerned about disclosing her disability, but she doesn't want to be put into disciplinary action. And that's something that we hear quite frequently, uh, particularly on our team, because the disabilities are, tend to be hidden, that people st struggle with that decision about when and where and with whom and how much to disclose. Um, but in this case, the employee did decide to do that, and she provides the medical documentation to substantiate her disability. And since her work doesn't depend on or affect other employees, the employer was able to allow her to flex her schedule as long as she gets her time in during their core business hours between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the next example is a middle school teacher who needs to take off one afternoon a week for 16 weeks in order to attend an intensive outpatient therapy program uh, that her practitioner recommended. And he actually feels that uh, that treatment will help her in the long run to end up using less leave. Um, so the employer already had a mechanism in place to bring in substitute teachers, uh, so they had no hardship in doing that, and they gave her the accommodation. Okay, and there's one last one here I'll finish up with. An employee working in a state corrections facility has difficulty waking up due to new medications she had been described uh, she had been prescribed because of her inability to get to work on time and attend work on at all on some days her employer provided her with an accommodation of leave 
to help her manage the side effects of the medication. And, and I just want to say this leave was a last resort. Leave is not a good accommodation unless that's what the person needs. Sometimes people think, oh, we'll just put you on leave and that will take care of things. But a lot of times people can still work, and, and that is, is their, their right to work. They just may need some accommodations. And so this employer tried about everything to help her actually get to work because it was going to be better for her to actually work, you know, than to be at home. But the, they attempted many things and it didn't work, and so leave seemed to be the best thing to help her there. Okay, that is the end yeah, of our presentation. I know that's a lot of information bring at you in a short amount of time. Thank you so much. That was wonderful and great, great information. So we really appreciate it. Um, on your control panel, um, you can type in your questions that you may have for our two speakers today. Um, our first question is, I would like to become a registered nurse. What specific or are there any specific accommodations I could ask for? Well, well you, would, you would you would, would need, need to, to look, look at, at I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm getting like feedback. feedback. Can you hear me? I could hear you. Okay. okay. All right. So what you would want to look at is you could look at the, the, the job and, and what that job is going to entail and the training and then look at what the the major difficulties you have because of your disability. Um, you know, if you can't work nights, that, that might be an issue. Um, depending on how schedules are made and that would depend on if you were to get a job in a hospital where you might have to work 12-hour shifts and maybe starting out you'd have to work a night shift or if you worked in the doctor's office you know that would be different idea uh, different sch scheduling issues but um, there, there aren't specific accommodations for like a nurse so that the important thing would be to look at what the, the job entails, what those specific skills are that you might have difficulty with, and then look at how, how could those be accommodated. Uh, we do have a, pu a publication on, on nurses, and, and that might be helpful. That you can find on our website. Uh, you can also contact us, and we can help you with that if you can't find that. If you have uh, more specific questions than, than what I was just able to answer there, you can contact us. and. Um, here is our contact information. Our phone number here is 800-526-7234, and that you'll, you'll get a program assistant who will ask you some questions. And again, that information is all confidential. They just need to have certain information to know which consultants to direct your call to. Um, you can get on our website there at askjan.org. We have a, a wonderful website. Up at the top, uh, you can see on the slide there, up at the top there's a white uh, menu that goes across and over four menu bars, I guess you call them, there's an A to Z of disabilities and that you can click on that and look up accommodations for bipolar. There's also there, um, when, you, when you click on that, it'll come up by disabilities or by topic and there are topics there that you can look at as well. And the, the Jan at askjan.org is email and you can send us email questions and then we can send you the answers in email. Then and there's, there's for, for text, text and, and for, for uh, Skype. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Um, we have another sure. question. How long does it take from requesting accommodations to actual implementation of them? Well, well that's, that's a good, good that, 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 you know, you I schedule something that could be done tomorrow or, or in a couple days. If there's some kind of specialized equipment that might be needed, you know, that might have to be ordered. That may take longer. There is no set time frame under the ADA except that employers are supposed to work quickly to get that taken care of. Thank you. Our next question is, what are typical accommodations for teachers with bipolar disorder? Well, well that that, um, that may be having a, a mentor to work with, maybe to help. It would depend on, on what that teacher's difficulties were. And, you know, if you're a kindergarten teacher and you're a teacher, you're going to have way different um, difficulties than if you're teaching high school. Um, 
you know, you'd look at what your biggest difficulties are, maybe help with lesson plans, um, maybe support, maybe not moving from room to room. Some teachers, especially when they start new, you know, get the worst schedule. Sometimes they don't even have a classroom, and so they'll have a cart and they travel from room to room. That may not always be the best thing for someone that has issues with, with um, concentration or organization. Um, maybe teach in high school having less classes to prep for, less changes in subjects. You know, when I first, I was a teacher, and when I first started at a high school, I had the worst schedule, of course. I had like four preps. Um, other teachers had two. And so it's a lot easier, you know, the less preps you have, it's a lot easier to manage your, your time better. And we, we do, do have, have a publication, a publication on accommodations for teachers as well, and it covers all kinds of accommodations from physical and um, vision and hearing to cognitive and uh, emotional, all of those things. And you can find that on our website as well, or you can call and get assistance with that. Thank you. The next question is, um, are your services provided in any other languages? Yes, yes they, they are, are provided. provided. We have Spanish um, translate, translated materials on our website, but we also have a Spanish speaking person here that can help with that. Okay, wonderful. And then I'll just, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you both so much for being with us today, and thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. All right, All right thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.